this week on Backtable Podcast. So one of the first things that we really wanted to to focus on as a lipometric was patient activation measure. If you've not heard of it, it is essentially a extensively validated metric which looks at an individual's knowledge, confidence and skills in managing their own health. So essentially a measure on self-efficacy. Health coaching is all about empowering individuals to take personal accountability for their own health. So it fits with what we're doing and we have seen consistent improvements across all of our deployments, uh, whether it's um, research-based or standard commercial deployments. We've seen consistent improvements across all sites. And what's particularly beneficial is or what particularly encouraging rather for us is that those of lowest activation at program entry seem to benefit the most from the program. So we're hitting people who really need our help the most and they're getting the most benefit out of it. Welcome to Backtable Innovation. You can find all our previous episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and at backtable.com. This is the next instalment of Backtable Innovation where we all learn from physicians and entrepreneurs working hard to drive healthcare forward. My name's Deanna and I'll be your host this week. I'm a physician and biomedical engineer in London, joining Backtable to bring more European voices to the show. On today's episode, I'm super excited to be welcoming Robbie Huddlestone, the founder of Surgery Hero and an emergency medicine physician. So Robbie, welcome to the show. So to start off, why don't you introduce yourself to our listeners? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me. Pleasure to be here and pleasure to your audience. My name is Robbie Huddleston. I'm co-founder and chief medical officer at Surgery Hero. And we're a digital clinic that helps people prepare for and recover from elective surgery at home. And we do that by combining one-to-one health coaching with a digital learning platform that helps people prepare for their, he- for their operation ahead of time. Great. So from reading about Surgery Hero online, I understand that what you're describing is this concept of prehabilitation. A lot of our listeners are physicians, they're urologists, OBGYN doctors, interventional radiologists that do procedures on a day-to-day basis. Could you just help us sort of ground the audience and understand what the concept of prehabilitation is? So for me, prehabilitation simply means the process of actively preparing for a medical intervention ahead of time. We didn't invent it, it's been around for a while and it really comes from oncology initially where patients were supported to really improve their functional capacity, their physiological reserve ahead of undergoing chemotherapy. But obviously there, there are overlaps there between going for chemo and going for surgery. And so us in the perioperative world have borrowed that and applied it to the surgical journey. I would say that it has evolved from when it first came about. Initially, it was all about becoming physically fit and, and the emphasis to really put on exercise and, and physical activity. And that's still very important, but I think we now have a much greater understanding of what it means to prepare for an operation or or for cancer treatment of any kind. And a lot more goes into it than just hitting the gym and trying to get fit. We put a lot of emphasis on a whole person approach. Holistic care is at the core of what we do. And we support people with physical activity, with improving their nutrition, um, looking after their mental well-being, improving their sleep, anything else that really forms a part of their preparation to operation. Obviously, smoking, alcohol, and any other lifestyle behaviors that they feel they could improve to be, be more prepared for the operation. That's really awesome. And it's great to hear how that's evolved from just, you know, taking it your baseline up with exercise physiology to very much a holistic approach, as you describe. You mentioned um, you have a digital learning platform. So how does that sort of integrate into prehabilitation? I would say it consists of, of two main components. The, the first is the, the app, um, the Surgery Hero app, which is a digital learning platform which supports patients in terms of the education process, what it means to prepare for surgery, what's involved in terms of going for an operation and what the recovery will look like. And we, we tailor that to the individual. We all have modifiable risk factors when going for surgery, but they, they vary from person to person. So let's take an example. If there's someone who maybe is a bit overweight and they're going for, let's say, a knee replacement and Weight loss is really your key focus for, for your surgical journey. That's where we start them. We build in the other elements of preparing the surgery around that. So the, the app that you get will have a different interface compared to someone who really may, might be on top of the weight management side of things and physical activity, but they want to focus on on the mental preparation. And, and so that will be the, the, the focal point of, of their app experience. And we build it around that. The second component of what we do is health coaching. And I really think that's the at the core of what we do. That's really where where we get our best results from. Um, health coaching, I guess it's a lot, it's, I think it's been around in, in the US for a while longer than it has in the UK, but my definition of health coaching is the 
art of facilitating a person's active participation in managing your own health. It's a bit of a mouthful, but I think that sums up quite nicely. And everyone uh, who, undergo, who, who joins the Surgery Hero program is paired with their own health coach who works with them on a one-to-one basis throughout the program. Um, so there's an opportunity to form a bit of rapport. Um, you're not chopping and changing between individuals. And, and really, when we, when we get the really glowing positive feedback, which I think happens pretty frequently, I'm, I'm quite proud of that. But when we get that really good feedback, it tends to be about the coach and the coaching experience and what, what that individual meant to them. But combining the two things um, enables us to scale the, the program a little bit further. The coach is really there to help people. That's awesome. You know, as a doctor, or I, don't know, I remember back in med school, you'd, you'd have hours and hours of teaching on motivational interviewing and, you know, what it really means to elevate a patient's baseline. But it's just so hard to do in practice. Who delivers the health coaching? Is it physicians or is it delivered by some sort of specialized individuals who just focus on prehabilitation? So we have a team of health coaches that actually come from, from a variety of backgrounds. We have people who started off their professional career in dietetics. I myself was a, a medic, emergency physician in the NHS, people from a psychology background, sport and exercise sides. Really, the, the starting point is that we, we want our coaches to be familiar working with people in a clinical environment. So we ask everyone to have a minimum of two years patient facing experience. And then health coaching it, it is an evolving role in itself. And we want experienced coaches coming on board. So everyone has at least a year's experience of pure health coaching who joins the surgery or team. Once they're a part of the team, we put them through our own internal training process. So to answer your question, there, there is no kind of set phenotype for, for our coaches. They come from, from a variety of backgrounds, but really the core of what they do is about behavior change. And they're all very experienced in helping people to optimize their lifestyle behaviors. That's great. And um, can you walk me through, what does the journey look like as a patient? So you used sort of the knee surgery example, but perhaps we could go to an example for, I don't know, a patient undergoing a urology procedure or an obstetrics and gynecology procedure, if you have one. Sure. What I would say is that the user journey varies according to every individual who comes on the program. There, there are no two programs that look the same. And that's because, as I've mentioned, we take a whole person approach. Your priorities will be different to the next person. But let, let's take a gynae example, OBGYN example, as, as you've mentioned. I can recall a recent patient, or we, we actually refer to our patients as members because we, we try to, we want everyone kind of operating on the same level and patient kind of gets a hierarchical impression. It's very collaborative between our coaches and our members. And I can recall quite recently receiving feedback from one of our members who was a lady, I think in her mid thirties, undergoing laparoscopic endometriosis procedure. I guess her priority going in, going into the program was all about becoming physically fit. I think she, she also indicated that she would like to lose some weight ahead of the operation. But when I, when I read her, her, her feedback at the end, what she pointed to most was the feeling of support, the feeling of emotional preparedness that she got from working with her coach. And that all comes from the weekly coaching sessions between coach and member. We, we try to encourage everyone to meet up a minimum of, of once per week, either through a video or a phone call, but they also have the opportunity to message their coach through the app um, whenever, whenever it's convenient for them. And it is entirely personalized. There, there is no set model. As I mentioned at, at the top of the show, everyone has their areas of priority. Everyone has things that are going to be of greatest impact to them. We start there and build the rest in around that. It all comes down to the fundamentals of lifestyle medicine. What, what does good physical activity look like? What does good sleep look like? What does good nutrition look like? That, yeah, that forms the basis of everything we do. Yeah, and it sounds like you really offer people a chance to consider what it means to have a surgery with your endometriosis. An example reminded me of a conversation I recently had with Sahil, the founder of Plexa. So they have a device that helps precondition the skin in preparation for surgery. But actually one of the, the collateral benefits of going through that process is actually just exactly what you describe, an opportunity to feel supported before you enter the OR. Exactly. I think I'm familiar with the Pex uh, product as well. It's actually a really exciting product. I haven't had a chance to, to meet him yet, but um, we've been on calls together and it looks like a really interesting innovation. But yeah, it's, it's exactly that. I think w- what I'm encouraged by time and time again is that we kind of use the operation as a focal point, but really that's just one one part of what's going on in people's lives. And it's so easy for us as, as doctors and hospital to overlook the, the whole picture. And I think coaches really fill that gap in care that people feel when when they can maybe sometimes feel a little bit 
like a patient on an OR table rather than a person undergoing a life experience. And so we talked a bit about the patient journey, but what about from a physician perspective? So I am an OBGYN in clinic, right? I know that my patient needs an operation for endometriosis. How do I refer them to Surgery Hero? And what kind of feedback do I get from Surgery Hero to know how my patients are progressing? So to date, we're a London-based company and all of our clients in the UK are actually NHS trusts um, or NHS hospitals. So we receive our referrals. Super impressive. <laughs> Thank you, yes. I mean, the, the NHS, it's a tough nut to crack, but it's it, they, they're they great clients. But, but once, you, once you can get there, and obviously it's where I did my training, where I grew up, medical school and everything else. So I feel comfortable in that environment, but I know that it, it can be challenging. But yeah, so we receive our referrals directly from the hospital. It does vary from a from hospital to another. Sometimes they're, they're more cherry-picked by the consultant or attending, looking after that individual. Sometimes a bit more of a kind of scattergun approach where we, we get wise, large scale referrals from the, the waiting list teams and then we contact those individuals and see if they're interested. So it really does vary. We've got research running across a few different hospitals as well where obviously the due diligence before bringing someone on is a little bit more sophisticated. But yeah, I would say we're working with, with, with NHS. It comes, it comes from the hospital. Outside of that, our CEO, Matt, is currently in the US trying to get a pilot set up there for the first time. And obviously that's going to work very, very differently. We see a big opportunity working with employers, first and foremost as an employer, employee benefit solution. Because we know that having surgery is the third leading cause of workplace absenteeism. There's a lot to be gained there if we can support people in the work environment. I'd say the main priority for us is that we're not adding workload to the clinicians already in hospital. We kind of run in parallel. They look after the medical optimization and we look after the lifestyle side of things and what patients can, can do for themselves. And so does a communication channel exist between surgery here and the physicians themselves or, or do they sort of run separately? For the most part, we run separately. We, we hold, and again, it's kind of client dependent, but we do monthly check-ins where we, we feed back in terms of engagement rate activation and what our patient reported that comes to look like. And, and we then are able to align those with the, with the hospital outcomes, length of stay in hospital complication rates. Some people, some surgeons do like kind of have, have their finger on the pulse a little bit more and we're very happy to meet on a more regular basis. But usually what we get back from, from the hospital is we want this to happen, but we don't want it to take up too much of our time. So you guys do what you do and we'll do what we do. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Now, I was wondering if there was sort of a dashboard and how physicians interacted with that, but I agree with you. I think sometimes just having a, like you have confidence in a mechanism of action of a drug, you want to have confidence in the mechanism of action of the lifestyle intervention that you're prescribing, which would be surgery hero. So just being able to get that feedback and data is great. It's like, I'll order use and ease to check if my Ramapril is not causing any issues. I can, uh, I can touch base with surgery hero and make sure that we're on track with prehabilitation as an intervention. We put a lot of emphasis on, on governance ahead of time. So what, when, we're, when we're scoping a new project, you know, who's going to be our clinical port of contact? There is a, a concern that we need to get in contact with. We rarely need to utilize those channels. We keep the, the medical and the lifestyle as, as separate as possible. And what about potential barriers using surgery here? So, you know, I've worked in East London for all of my career so far. And I know, you know, there's lots of barriers to delivering lifestyle interventions. Difference in health literacy, differences in tech literacy. And you talk about a very personalized care. So I was just wondering whether you had any approaches to overcome this. Those barriers exist. There's no doubt about it. And we, we still have work to do to continue to, to overcome those barriers and make our product as accessible as possible. In saying that, let, let's start with the tech. We have been delivered in, in making our product available across both, for example, Android and iOS. And we make use of native accessibility features so that people of, of an older generation can, can use our, our app comfortably. And from a, you mentioned health literacy perspective, we are very, very deliberate in terms of all of our content writing to make sure that it is written in simple English. We have an average reading age of about 10 or 11 years for everything that we write. So there are things that we can do upfront to make sure that as many people can make use of our product as possible. Of course, so we know that not everyone, but members of the older generation maybe are less comfortable engaging with a technical solution. And that's fine. But my argument or my, my response to that is, well, there is a large part of the population who enjoy using tech and prefer use tech. And by, by giving those individuals an outlet that isn't based within the hospital means that we're freeing up scarce 
clinician resources for the people who, who really do need that face-to-face input. We have more challenges to overcome. For example, we are only available in English at the moment. And we recognise that, especially as you mentioned, in East London, that there are offices in East London. <laughs> yes, um, London is a multicultural city. The UK is a multicultural country. And we're working on trying to make our product available to as wide an audience as possible. But certainly in terms of digital exclusion, people being unable to access a product, that's something that is always at the forefront of our mind. We have patient and public involvement groups that we work with to try and make sure that what we're creating actually hits the right note for the right people. Yeah, and I imagine that's been incredibly important in the research that you've des- you've described. Can you tell me a little bit more about what, what are the research projects undergoing at the moment and what kind of outcomes are you seeing in terms of recovery times, uh, patient satisfaction? Yeah, so we have our first RCT running live at the moment, which we're very proud of. It took a lot to get off the ground. And actually, while I have the opportunity, I want to, want to thank the Small Business Research Initiative for, for funding that, that research. That's across three, three sites, Sherwood Forest Hospital, um, Royal Berkshire and Derby Hospital. And that is looking at preoperative health coaching to support people undergoing lower limb arthroplasty, so hip, hip and knee replacement surgery. We are about three quarters of the way through recruit. And so far, so good. We only have preliminary data to report back on, but we've seen a, a decrease in length of stay. We've seen very positive member feedback. We've also heard from the clinicians in the hospital that it has made their life easier in a lot of ways. So we, we don't have the, the data to show back, uh, to report back for that yet, but it's looking promising. Um, we have a number of live kind of, I would, I'd classify as standard commercial deployments across England, and we never stop generating evidence. So whether it's clinical trial-led evidence or whether it's real-world data from which we can generate real-world evidence, we're always trying to demonstrate the value of our product. And we, uh, for example, just recently, and we'll be exhibiting this at the EPPON Congress Evidence-Based Parable Medicine Congress in, in a couple of months. We've seen that we've been able to reduce average length of stay in Cheshire Merseyside and integrated care board by over two days, which we didn't expect actually. We didn't expect such a, a pronounced benefit, but that's been really, really um, encouraging for us that the hospital staff are delighted by it. And that's looking across all major surgery professionally, so not, not confined to hip and knee. So there is promise in what we're doing, obviously. Yeah, that's really great. It's no easy feat getting these clinical trials up and running. So congratulations. It's very excited to see the outcomes of that. You mentioned reduced length of stay as one of the outcomes. What other outcomes can you gather from the app? You mentioned patient reported outcomes as well, but I'm curious to know if there's sort of any specific metrics you're looking at. So one of the first things that we really wanted to to focus on as a like metric was patient activation measure. If you've not heard of it, it is essentially a, it's been extensively validated. And I think it comes from actually a company called Freesia, or it used to be called Insignia in the US. An extensively validated metric, which looks at an individual's knowledge, confidence, and skills in managing their own health. So essentially a measure of self-efficacy. Health coaching is all about empowering individuals to take personal accountability for their own health. So it fits with what we're doing. And we have seen consistent improvements across all of our deployments, uh, whether it's um, research-based or standard commercial points, we've seen consistent improvements across all sides. And what's particularly beneficial is, or what particularly encouraging rather for us is that those of lowest activation at program entry seem to benefit the most from the program. So we're, we're hitting people who really need our help the most and they're getting the most benefit out of it. We try to collect as much data as possible without overburdening our, our members. And what we, we look at self-reported health metrics as well. So we look at physical activity, nutrition, sleep, mental well-being, and again, consistently across all sides, we're seeing those numbers go up. The hospital metrics, length of stay, et cetera, complication rate, again, we're seeing improvements. They're a bit more difficult to get because we don't own, we don't own that data, but certainly across the board, it seems to be working. That's awesome. No, we're super excited to see the results of that study. And it sounds like you guys have really overcome, you know, this problem of clinical adoption that many digital health companies and medical device companies come across. Could you talk us through a, a few of the challenges, perhaps in the earlier days of Surgery Hero, of convincing people to deliver this care via, via an app? Yeah, I, mean, I actually think our experience is pretty pretty standard in, in the digital health world, certainly w- within the, the UK. Finding a clinical champion, someone who believes in your product, is not difficult. Usually we can meet over coffee and the individual will, will come out as um, being totally in our corner. What can be more challenging is convincing the, the rest of the 
stakeholders in the hospital. Digital health is a complex scheme. It's a high barred entry for good reason, I think, because we're dealing with individuals and, and their livelihoods. But you've got to make sure that you hit the right note with the information governance team, the clinical safety team, any kind of internal communication channels that has to all be lined up. And our, our approach to that has been to make it as difficult as possible for the other stakeholders to say no. So we essentially present a portfolio of governance and compliance information right from the very beginning. And we say, hopefully this, this ticks all the boxes. If it doesn't, tell us what you need and we'll, we'll come back with it. Um, I mean, I always think about stakeholders and the patients, the practitioners, so the doctors, the providers, so the institution, whatever that might be, and then the payers. So it sounds like you go up that hierarchy with the evidence up front, which is great. What about reimbursement? How do you convince uh, sort of payers to get the dollars out to pay for, for the service? I would love to speak to some of your audience in the US and hear their thoughts on this. We're three and a half years old now and we had a, a kind of SaaS business model in mind when we started off. We thought we'll, we'll build monthly recurring revenue taking over. That's what people want to see. We found out very quickly when working with the NHS that they don't like that. They, they, want, to, they want to be built up from and pay for everything in one go, which obviously we like, but it, it, it required a change in, in business model. We expect, as I said, Matt, Matt Sight in America at the moment, trying to understand the, the, the market a bit better. We expect it to operate quite differently in America. And obviously, um, you have the, the CPT investment codes and everything else. And that's a complete departure from how things operate in the UK. So what we would love is to, to work with a clinician, a, a, a center anywhere in America to understand their needs as a, as a healthcare provider. What do they expect from a, a digital health company and how can we work with them? Because it's totally different across the pole. Yeah, this is a completely different model. And if any of our listeners uh, want to get in touch, what's the best way for them to reach you? Uh, well, anyone can contact me. I'm on Robbie at surgeryhero.com. Our website is surgeryhero.com. And if you search for us on, on LinkedIn, just type uh, searching surgery hero, you, you can find us there. But I'd, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Awesome. Yeah, the, it sounds like the reimbursement question is always, it's always a tricky one. And it sounds like having flexibility in the model that you, you approach is the way forward here. Definitely. So in the, in the NHS, at least, or like for an institution, you sort of get reimbursed on a whole population basis. They pay up front for sort of any patient that requires a surgery and wants to access the service. That's how it, it's working at the moment. Yeah, so we don't bill our, our members. It all comes from the NHS. The NHS is, is the payer. It's, it's a part of part of the service that the individ, individuals receive while they're in hospital. We like that model because we, we don't want our members to feel under pressure, but I know that things operate differently across the pub. And what about, um, how's the engagement been? So say I'm in a hospital, I have 100 patients a year that go through an operation and I offer surgery hero to all of them. How many of them can we expect to actively engage with you guys? That's a good question. And, and the answer is, that it's, it's highly variable. When we work with a provider, so when it comes to re research, for example, they've already spoken to a research nurse and they've got that buy-in. It's nearly 100% will take up the offer of, of rehabilitation when, when referred with, with that population. If we're reaching out to a population at large, they've been on the waiting list for a while and it's almost like a, a cold call scenario, then the, the uptake drops and we're working off about one in three of people being approached without any prior communication from us or from the hospital will take up the offer. But there's a lot, we, we've got a lot of work to do always with, with the trust and with the hospitals in terms of building trust, making sure that when people get this invite to join the program that they don't think that we're, we're trying to scam them or anything like that. But I'm really encouraged by the uptake from the research because it shows what we can get from, from the wider deployments if, if we do things right. Yeah, it's really great. It's not easy to convince people to sort of engage in that discussion. You know, I have limited experience in prehabilitation, but um, work very closely with oncology patients in the setting that we described earlier. And, you know, it's hard to identify the right time to think about lifestyle factors. It's not always on that first appointment where, you know, you tell them that, you know, they're ready for chemotherapy or it's time for chemotherapy. It might sometimes be on a follow up appointment after some blood tests and more of an informal conversation where they they really feel ready to engage and you can refer them to the dietitian and you can refer them to the exercise physiologist, a physiotherapist, a social worker, whoever it might be to move things forward. That's absolutely right. And, and I think the art of health coaching 
is about how you can move people through that stages of change model. Yeah. We get a lot of people at the kind of pre-contemplation, contemplation stage and how, how do we kick them in, in the, into action? That, that really comes down to the skill of the individual working with them. And so when is surgery hero offered? Is it offered at that first appointment when they get a diagnosis or they're offered a surgery or is it later down the line that they're contacted? I'm going to give the same answer that it varies. And okay. <laughs> it varies according to, to the hospital, hospital we're working right. with. We try to keep things as uniform as possible. But for example, we're currently working with Portsmouth Hospital in, in South Africa. We're running a, a small feasibility study for colorectal cancer patients on undergoing bottom section. They typically have a three to four week lead time before their operation, just given the, the nature of the diagnosis. There is a lot can be done within three to four weeks and, and we get people on as quickly as we can and we get them working to, to prepare for the operation. But people waiting for hip or knee surgery could have waited already two years and, and we, we might get them with, with another year to wait. Sometimes the kind of su- sweet spot would be if we had people for two months pre-op and one month post-op. That's, that's what we like to work with it. But we, we understand that healthcare is variable. We try to be as flexible to meet the needs for patients as possible. I mean, it's great. It sounds like you guys offer a really bespoke service that puts, you know, the providers and the patients at the center of what it is you're trying to deliver. And it sounds like you guys offer the service mainly for elective surgery. Have you ever explored what non-elective surgery could look like? So just that post-operative prehabilitation, well, it wouldn't be prehabilitation, it'd be rehabilitation. Yeah, we haven't actually ventured into, into that area of healthcare yet. How I describe the program currently is that we offer ideally two months of prehab and one month of post-op support. Again, as, as I mentioned, that, that can vary. I think we would love to, to be able to offer surgery here to people undergoing emergency surgery, but we haven't quite figured out the logistics in terms of how we would get them on board at the right time and, and figure it all out after. Yeah, it makes sense. It sounds like you it would be applicable for anyone being discharged from hospital. So elective surgery is definitely the right place to start. You've got to stay focused. And what's next to Surgery Hero? Like, how might you guys leverage technology? You know, we have all this talk about generative AI these days and new ways that technology impacts our lives. What's next in store, both from a clinical development standpoint and a technological development standpoint? So certainly from my point of view, from a clinical standpoint, is to continue to, to generate our evidence base. We have emerging evidence looking at orthopedics at the moment. I, I mentioned the kind of real world evidence for pretty much all specialties, but we need to continue to kind of, my, my way of looking at it is leapfrog from specialty specialty, showing that this method works across the board. From a product development perspective, I've talked a lot about the importance of our coaches and how they really develop or the, how they really deliver the value. And that isn't going to change, which human led care is at the center of everything we do, but that's not a terribly scalable resource. So we need to continue to figure out how we can leverage the app to make best use of our, of our coaches and, and their resources. So how we scale is going to be a challenge for the, for the years ahead. Thankfully, we're not the first people to approach that challenge. There are companies in, in the US like Livongo and, and Omada who have demonstrated, or, and Hinge Health, for example, that you can, you can take a health coaching solution and you can scale it. It just requires a lot of hard work and people, smart people getting around the table, I think, a lot of the time, figure it out. And what, what have their approaches been? Has it been, you know, leveraging chatbots or predominantly? It's very incremental from, from what I can see. So, and, and what we've already integrated a few of these techniques. So one-to-one health coaching is, is great. You know, that, that's what we're all about, but not everyone is interested in that demo. Some people like to be part of a group. When, when you coach people as part of a group, then you can hit multiple people at a time. Integrating kind of lecture-based webinars, again, is another option. Omada, Lavonga, all these companies will use chat forms within the app. So when you're not speaking to your coach, you can you get that peer-to-peer support, which is often the most valuable thing. Getting feedback from people with the lived experience is, is incredibly valuable. And then you get into the more kind of technical things like chatbots and, and how you can remove the human all, all together. But the human will always be there for us in, in some way, shape or form. Completely agree. They're the ones who really develop the empathetic care. And it's interesting you mentioned the chat forums just before you came on the show. Aaron and I were talking about how Reddit would be our go-to if we were struggling to choose what size to buy a TV. I can see how that translates to healthcare, right? Maybe you just want to know, how can I use my crutches? What's the best way to prevent sores on my hands? And sometimes you just need that tribal knowledge. Exactly. I had a, a member say previously, I wish that somebody had told me that when I went for my, my knee operation, 
to bring shorts with me to the hospital because it was a nightmare getting getting trousers back on after you. That kind of lived experience you account for in any other way. You know, I've never been through any operation, but my members have. Yeah, I know. I also had another Georgia from Ottobock, a prosthesis company on the show, who mentioned that, you know, you've got to step backwards when you open a door. I hadn't noticed. And now I think about it all the time. So I'd love to hear a bit more about you, Robbie. We've talked a lot about surgery here, but what inspired the change to medicine? You know, a lot of our listeners, especially on the innovation show, are entrepreneurial in spirit, and they have these ideas, but not sure how to bring an idea from zero to one. What inspired you to make that jump? I'm not sure that my story is particularly inspiring. I was a an emergency res- resident or trainee in London, and I loved my job in the beginning. And then I and then I realised that maybe it wasn't quite for me. So I looked I looked towards other avenues, and there was a company operating in, in London at the time called Meadowpad. They're now called Shuma. I think they have a bit of a, a presence in in the US as well, but not, now called Shuma. And they needed someone, they needed a clinician to come on and be what what's called in, in the UK their clinical safety officer, but essentially be the individual in charge of their risk management. So I got given the opportunity after not being quite sure what I wanted to do, taking a step out of clinical practice, going into digital health. And I really enjoyed it. And I met a few cool people at that company where we talked about our own ideas and what we would do if we were in charge of a digital health company. And a year or two later, I ended up finding Surgery Hero with actually a few of us were, were, were friends from Ireland already, but, but we kind of came together in the digital health space. And yeah, I, got, I, I realized very quickly I get a lot of fulfillment out of creating something from, from scratch. It kind of scratched an itch that I didn't know existed up until that point. And I guess things just went on from there. Nice. And what was the process of building out an MVP? You know, so you've got this idea of a prehabilitation app, but it doesn't just grow into surgery here overnight, right? You've got messy iterations in the middle. I'd love to hear a little bit more about, you know, how you took, put that idea into action. Yeah, uh, this is something I, I'm actually quite proud of because I think we did like the ultimate kind of bootstrapping startup in the beginning. There were, we're, we're, I'm one of four founders uh, and we kind of cover all bases. I'm uh, the, the medical guy. We've got a couple of previous founders. We've got Adam, who was a, a product manager at Spotify before and really knows how to build it a really sticky product that consumers love. And so we did everything to just support us initially. We got some external help in terms of the product development, software development. But for the first year, I coached everyone. I, did, I, I learned how to health coach and um, studied up on, on lifestyle medicine. And I coached every single one of our members, which was hard work, but it gave me an incredible insight into to what it's all about and people's experience when going for surgery. And yeah, Adam, product manager, fair play to him. He repurposed himself and became a product designer overnight and he designed the product from scratch. Uh, I wrote all of the educational content. So we really did everything ourselves. But uh, yeah, we it was tough, but we learned a lot of lessons along the way, I would say. A trial by fire. Are all four of you positions? No, there, there's actually two of us are. There's me and there's Matt. Although Matt, Matt realized very early on in his career that he, he was an entrepreneur at heart. Um, so we're, this is actually his second startup and yeah, he, he, it's been a while. He, he knows stuff still. I'm not trying to discredit him, but it's been a while since he was in hospital. <laughs> <laughs> okay, nice. And what kind of backgrounds do the other two co-founders come from? Because I know like one of the biggest challenges in turning ideas into actions is just partnering with people with the right skills. And it's very difficult to identify what those skills are when you don't have exposure to building a product. Yeah, I'd say we have very diverse professional backgrounds, Luke actually started off life as a barrister, I guess an, an, an arbitrator, a, a lawyer, and would be in terms of yes terminology. He moved through various careers before founding a, a another startup called, they were called Space Health. They, they were essentially kind of like Airbnb for office space. But he did that and then got really into, I guess, coming from his, his legal background, got really into data protection, information governance, that kind of thing. So He's been totally invaluable for us in terms of having these conversations with hospitals about how we manage data. He's an expert in in the in GDPR, the European data legislation. And Adam Adam comes from a from a technical background. He was a senior product manager at Spotify, but worked for other big companies, Tesco, Cedars. So he knows what it means or what, what's involved in creating a really good product. And I think if any of the four components of the founders had been missing, we, we wouldn't have got to where we're at at the moment. Yeah, it sounds like the dream team assembled. Chief negotiator, chief product officer, <laughs> chief medical officer, 
boom, surgery hero. What about mentorship along the way? You know, lots of people talk about um, fundamental relationships that help them maybe not take zero to one, but one to two. Uh, has there is there anyone in particular that's been important for surgery hero and how that has that relationship evolved yeah I, I, absolutely i kind of speak for myself on this because we all have our, our own people that we've we've looked to and turned towards when, when we needed a bit of guidance and advice for me it's been professor jerry daniel who is a an attending anesthetist consultant anesthetist in southeast hospital in, in the northeast of england He's also an expert in prehabilitation and multimodal prehabilitation, which is kind of our job. He is vice president of the International Prehab Society. So he was kind of the perfect individual to meet. And as it turned out, he actually contacted me originally and said, I've seen your product. I'm interested. Tell me more about it. And after the first conversation, we had agreed on running a pilot in his hospital. And in the second conversation, we agreed on bringing him on as an advisor. So he would be, he'd be the the one man that I, w- I would call out, but we all have our, our people that we've really relied upon in the last few years. Oh, that's incredible. The, I hadn't considered the anesthetist role here. Who is easier to convince, the surgeon or the anesthetist in the value of surgery here? Who's, who's easy? I think I need to be careful with what I say here. Um, but <laughs> I, I would say the anesthetist, but increasingly the surgeons are buying into the idea. Um, but perioperative medicine, perioperative care, evolved from anesthetics originally um, anesthesiology originally and, and so I think that's why they're a year or two ahead in terms of buying into the idea but I've, I've also worked with and continue to work with a lot of really great surgeons who, who totally get it yeah no, I completely understand I think we've got to have buy-in from both at the end of the day but you know sometimes one's easier to nudge than other so I always like to ask our guests do you have any recommendations where can people learn more about building a product, digital health or prehabilitation um, if they're interested in learning more? Oh, okay. The first place I would say to look is the CPOC Centre for Perioperative Care website. I think is cpoc.org. CPOC is a thought leadership body in the UK whose primary purpose is about advancing perioperative care and how it's delivered. It comes from the, the Royal College or they come from the Royal College of Anesthetists. But if you go on their website, you'll find loads of great resources for both patients and clinicians. I, I think that it's, it's the number one place I'm saying, look, if you want to learn about prehab and perioperative medicine. I'd also give a shout out to the, to EBPOM, Evidence Based Perioperative Medicine. They have their World Congress in London in July, but I, I believe it's available online too. And again, they're, they're another body whose primary purpose in life is pushing forward perioperative medicine. And this year at the World Congress, the key theme is prehab and we're actually exhibiting a poster so good place to look the final recommendation i would give for anyone listening who has heard me talk about health coaching a lot who is kind of wondering what is that all about there is a book called coaching for health by dr Artie maney and jenny rogers and it is a great introduction for any clinician out there who would like to incorporate coaching techniques into how they deliver care, I think that would be a, a, an excellent starting point. It's a great book. Oh, awesome. I'm sure many of our listeners will be uh, looking up those resources. Robbie, it's been really great to have you on the show. Super excited to learn about Surgery Hero and just get a little bit more into the weeds of what prehabilitation is and how we can deliver better care for our patients that have procedures. I'm also very excited to see how this progresses and seeing Surgery Hero in the US soon. And I hope this calls to our listeners to check out your product and see how it will best fit into current practices. It's been my pleasure and thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at Backtable Innovation on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable Innovation is produced and hosted by Brian Hartley, Aaron Fritz, Diana Velasquez Pimentel, and Eric Yamaker. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Social media and PR by Anne Dang. Administrative support provided by Jim Willie Kinnebrew. Thanks again for listening. See you again next week.